needs. It is precisely this same mystery of electromagnetic signals that has another scientist intrigued. Yeah, this freedom and Freud. German physicist Friedemann Freud works at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Freund is doing his research both at NASA and at the University of San Jose in California. The discovery he made decades earlier still preoccupies him. Freund found that when the crystalline structure of certain rocks is destroyed, electrical current is generated. He's prepared an experiment to prove his hypothesis. Well, this piston is pressing down and you see here there is double electrical insulation between the piston and the rock. And when we press this in this volume between the piston, act charges will be activated. And then they flow out, the positive holes, the holes flow out in this direction and the electrons flow out in the back direction. The test object is a piece of gabbro rock. The choice of rock is significant because it forms most of the Earth's crust at the depth of 10 yeah. to 20 kilometers. Okay, now we are ready to go. Bit by bit, 10 tons of pressure is loaded on. But initially there was a very big spike. Well, there are these two currents flowing already now out of the rock. But when we now increase the speed, you will see that in these two meters at the bottom, these numbers the positive number in the middle and the negative number at the bottom both will go up as more and more current is going to flow out of the rocks. The tension in the lab is palpable. Freund and his assistants have their eyes glued to the meters. Then suddenly the numbers on the meters jump. Electrical current has been released. The experiment is a success. Rocks are normally insulators. Now when we squeeze a rock, we suddenly activate in this otherwise insulating rock a bunch of electronic charge carriers. And they spread out into the rock and to the surface. And at the surface, these electronic charge carriers generate enormous electric fields, fields of the order of a million volts per centimeter. And these Local electric fields produce strange phenomena in the air, like they ionize the air. They can even cause corona discharges along the edges of the rock. And it is possible that animals are sensitive to some of these phenomena that we start to observe in the laboratory. Marsha Adams is a biologist. Before she began studying pre-earthquake animal behavior, she worked in a number of hospitals. There, she observed unusual changes in some of the patient's biological processes and the hours or days leading up to earthquakes. For instance, there would be unusually high or low rates of bleeding during surgery or out of the ordinary allergic reactions to drugs. She began monitoring this and made the link to electromagnetic waves. There are many hypotheses, many theories about how electromagnetic signals or long radio waves uh, influence biological processes. It probably happens at the cellular level, at the cell membrane level, um, but nobody knows for sure. There are uh, scientific organizations that are dedicated to studying the effects of uh, electricity on people. But uh, my guess is that it uh, that the long radio waves cause hormonal changes, um, things like adrenaline. Everybody knows about adrenaline, the, the fight or flight response. And that uh, this influences mood and behavior in the animals. Biological processes, animals, seem to be sensitive to certain frequencies of uh, electromagnetic radiation. And uh, these frequencies are capable of traveling around the world with very little what we call attenuation or decrease. So it's theoretically possible that some of these signals from a very, very large earthquake could reach the other side of the Earth and perhaps influence all the animals on Earth simultaneously, not just the ones in Los Angeles. The gibbons in Thailand's Kaolak National Park are familiar with human beings and like to come close to them.
We noticed something interesting four or five days before the tsunami. In this area, there are many squirrels and gibbons. They're used to humans, and the gibbons would often come all the way down to the main office. But during these four or five days, right before the tsunami happened, the gibbons stopped coming. They just disappeared. I admit that I didn't pay much attention at the time. I didn't really notice. For the next couple of weeks, I was very busy with lots of cleanup work to do. But my staff reported to me that for about 15 days after the tsunami, the gibbons stayed away. But then they started to come back. So they're back now. But they're more careful. They won't come down to the ground anymore. They just stay safely up in the trees. Kaulak Beach still bears the scars left behind by the killer waves. But as the landscape slowly recovers, so do the people. With aid from around the world, the work of rebuilding is well underway, with houses and hotels being constructed. Not only to provide shelter, but to revive the economic lifeline of tourism. People here say that beyond the havoc it wreaked, the tsunami taught them one important lesson. That animals are more sensitive to the signs of nature than they had ever realized. Because they sensed the danger. And had people paid heed, perhaps more lives might have been saved. We are observing animals and we are trying to understand how animals react and what it is they react to. Once we understand this, we can develop an early warning system. Still, mankind will take a while to get there. But we cannot simply rely on animals. We should analyze what animals are feeling, and then we should develop methods to measure and monitor their behavior. If large numbers of people were encouraged to look out for unusual animal behavior, if they noticed unusual behavior in pets or in wild animals, um, if they rang a special earthquake hotline um, or a tsunami hotline, um, then the warnings, I think, could be uh, brought together by a computer. If there was a surge of calls from a particular region, this could suggest that something was going to happen there. So I think with the internet and with telephones, it would be very easy to set up an animal-based warning system, at least on a research basis. I do know that there is a place in Job in the Bible where it says to get the answers, you go ask the beast. They have all the answers. We may not understand everything that happens just before a major earthquake, but we do know that if we were to listen to animals, perhaps we'd be one step closer to being prepared the next time disaster strikes.